אוקיי, מחברים גם לפייסבוק. אוקיי, 28, אוקיי. טוב, אז בואו נתחיל, אוקיי. Good evening everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dimitri Mevzos, I'm representing uh, World Designers Organization here in the UK and it's our second uh, lecture uh, from the series of lectures what we're going to have in the next month, two, three, four, wherever. Uh, 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 relax. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's hope yeah, it will be less, but uh, whenever we all stay home, we're happy to bring you um, amazing lectures from Israel. Uh, the last time, I don't know who was with us. Uh, 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 yes, I don't know if you uh, was with us the last time when we had uh, with you for Professor uh, Rani Ras from Das Hospital about the coronavirus. But today we're going to speak about something different about the Israeli situation. One of the best person who can talk about it is Gil Kobach. Uh, welcome. Uh, we, we, we're going to have a lecture and after the lecture, if you have a questions, uh, please write them in the chat and we will read them from there and we will answer. Thank you and let's enjoy uh, our evening. Hello everybody. So my name is Gil Chobav. I'm from Israel, from Tel Aviv. And uh, I've been doing a lot of um, food television and uh, for the past uh, 20 years or so, and I've uh, been writing about restaurants in Israeli newspapers and uh, internet, etc., etc., etc. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you a bit about uh, Israeli food and the Israeli cuisine uh, from, well, from the dawn of history up until today, you know that right now Israeli cuisine is having a moment or even an hour. Uh, but when and where did it all start? So uh, the first dish uh, that's mentioned in the Bible is a lentil soup. Uh, when Esau comes back and asks Jacob, give me some of that ruby red thing. Tell me min ha'adom ha'adom hazeh. And that's a very good question because why is it red? You know, Lentils were abundant in the land of Israel, even in biblical times and before. But as we know, even if you cook soup from orange lentils, they become like sort of a brown mush and they're not red. And uh, they couldn't have been, the, the soup couldn't have turned red because of tomatoes, because there were no tomatoes in the Middle East back then, nor peppers, no paprika, because these were not here. So what made the soup red? So this would be our first uh, picture. Let me just find it. It would be this one. Yes. This is sumak. Sumak is a Middle Eastern spice. It's purple. It's not red. But uh, we assume that this is what made the soup at least um, colorful because uh, sumac is a local spice and we use it a lot. Nowadays, it's, it's sort of sour and nowadays it's used uh, mainly in salads and mainly on top of onions. If you take one uh, white onions and put sumac on them, first of all, it's better tasting. And secondly, they get a lovely, lovely, lovely color. Now, the next dish that's mentioned in, in the Bible is the dish that we all fight about. It's hummus, it's chickpeas. Uh, we claim that um, hummus was mentioned in the Bible when Boaz meets Ruth in the field. He tells her in Hebrew, Come and dip your bread in vinegar. Chometz uh, is vinegar in Hebrew. But we assume that this is a writer's mistake and that the meaning, the intention was uh, chickpea puree because the, the Hebrew word is chimtza. So chometz, chimtza, it sounds the same. And actually, 
uh, chickpeas were, were very present in the Middle East, even before the Bible times. In excavations in the Carmel Mount in, in caves, they found um, legumes and chickpeas uh, from the Neanderthal times. So, you know, it, all the fights that are between Israel and Lebanon about who owns hummus, who owns chickpea puree, et cetera, et cetera, are futile because it belongs in the Middle East. Um, if we talk about chickpeas, uh, there is one dish that we definitely know where it came from, and this is falafel. But the dish that you see here is not falafel, this is ta'amiya. This is the original falafel, it's Egyptian. Falafel comes from Egypt. In Israel, people by mistake think that falafel may be Yemenite because uh, the vendors of falafel in the 50s in Israel were Yemenite people. They were, we, I'm half Yemenite, so we were traditionally poor. Therefore, we were falafel merchants. We were falafel vendors, but it's not uh, Yemenite, it's Egyptian. In Egypt, you make the original falafel not from chickpeas, but from fava beans, from dried fava beans. Uh, if we take another little jump on, we will find uh, this very, very, very famous meal, the Last Supper. Now, the Last Supper is, uh, we assume that it was a Seder, and these were Jews that were having the Seder, his, his uh, friends. And, but if you look carefully at the Leonardo da Vinci fresco that's in Milan, you will see that on the table, what the Jews are having in the Seder is shrimp. Well, it couldn't have been, first of all, we do not have shrimp in Jerusalem. Jerusalem doesn't have a seashore. Secondly, they're religious people. So obviously they were not having any shrimp, but this is what Leonardo knew. So in the, in the fresco, uh, Jews are having shrimp for uh, the Last Supper. I definitely hope that you're going to come and visit us in Israel uh, when this all ends. And if you do, I strongly recommend to go to a place called Neot Kdumim. Neot Kdumim is a biblical park, sort of in the middle of the road between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv near Modi'in. Here you can see how cheese was made in biblical time, times. So cheese, uh, you, you got milk, you would warm it. And then in order to make the milk curdle, you would use the sap of a fig tree. You know that fig trees have very uh, acidic uh, sap. It, it burns your hands if you touch it. But if you put it in milk, the milk curdles and this is how they used to make uh, cheese in biblical times. Um, let's take a giant leap and talk about the food that we had in Israel when Israel was established. So Israel is, you know, in the Middle East, but in the beginning, uh, the, the, let's say the group of people that were more uh, at the front of Zionism came from Europe. So food was actually uh, Eastern European. And uh, this would be what people were having uh, in the first years of Zionism or in the first years of Israel after it was established. It would be a filter fish or it would be galer, you know, this aspic of, of, of uh, bones. And, you know, I... Um, I had a TV show, uh, a daily food show on television. Now a daily show is a very hungry animal. You have to feed it and feed it and feed it all the time. And eventually you run out of items. So one of the, uh, the columns that I came up with in order to fill this show was called the Trauma Ward. And it was about celebrities coming to our show to taste the food that they like the least, like the food that they really dislike. And then they, we would talk about why they don't like it, et cetera. 80%, 80% of our guests would choose 
this guy, the regal kurusha, the galer, because it's really, you know, it's wobbly and it's, it's not something that you really want to eat. But these were poor times, and in poor times you eat whatever you can get. For instance, this friend, this is mellow. In, in Arabic, we call it hubeze. In Hebrew, I don't even know the Hebrew name. It's, it's, a, it's a green, it's sort of like a white spinach that you can find abundantly everywhere. During the siege of Jerusalem in the War of Independence in 1948, uh, the, well, we didn't have a government yet, but the authorities gave advice to the besieged Jerusalemites on how to cook mallow. And the Jordanians heard this on the radio and they said, well, we're about to win. If Jews start to eat chicken food, because usually mallow is fed to chicken, uh, then we're going to win. And luckily enough, they did not win, but the years that followed were very, very, very poor. Food in Israel was poor and food in Israel was poor. So we were living off bully beef. This is the box of bully beef that we got as the leftovers of the British army that left it here because you were luckier, you didn't want your bully beef. This is the inside of a bully beef uh, box. And uh, times, were, times were rough. 10 years later, it's already the 60s. Cooking is still very, very naive or modest. And as you can see, this is a cookbook from the 60s. You can see that it's, you know, it doesn't look like a current cookbook. It, it, it doesn't have the glam of a cookbook. Uh, food was still very European or Eastern European in Israel, but since this was the age of austerity, the 50s and the beginning of the 60s, um, Jews usually traveled to Arab cities, Arab Israeli cities, uh, to buy food in the black market. And over there in these cities, they got familiar with shawarma. Shawarma or grilled meats. This is very un-Eastern European, uh, but this is what we live off today. Uh, this is considered very, very, very Israeli. And this is something that we got definitely from our brothers, the Israeli Arabs. Uh, another dish that is slightly political is the, this very famous and very abundant fresh salad, very well chopped. You know, in Israel, you can find about, uh, the, 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 let's say, the views, the political views of a person by the way he refers to his salad, because right-wingers would call it Israeli salad and left-wingers would, would call it an Arab salad. So, you know, if a person talks about his salad and mentions Israeli or Arab, you may know where his heart is. Um, and then came the 80s. In the 80s, everybody got rich, Israel got rich, and we had a revolution, the wine revolution in Israel. You know that up until the 80s, Israel had only two winemakers, Carmel, the big winemaker, and another one, and that's it. And then came uh, the Ramat HaGolan winery, and they did the wine revolution in Israel. For the first time, wine was made in American New World methods in the Golan Heights in the north. And here you see a bottle of Katsrin. Katsrin is their top series. They claim that they make a Katsrin wine only in good years, but ever, ever since they started to make the Katsrin wine, I think it was uh, 1985, every year was a good year. So this is something very Israeli. Now we have more than 150 one winemakers in Israel. So from two to more than 150. After the wine revolution, we had the cheese revolution. So again, from two cheese makers in Israel, now we have something close to 300. 
This is Shai Zeltzer, the most famous cheesemaker in Israel. He lives in a cave with his goats near Jerusalem, makes wonderful, wonderful, wonderful goat and the sheep milk cheese. People claim that he has a very, very close relationship with his goats. I, I don't want to know. This is too much, but the cheese is wonderful. Um, Israel, again, is a Middle Eastern country in the center of every city. You would find the heart of the city, the market. So uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful picture of, I think is, it's the most beautiful market in Israel. It's the market in Akko, in Acre, in the north, north of Haifa. It's in the old city and it's lovely. And this is a picture from the Levinsky market in the south of Tel Aviv. So again, if you come to Tel Aviv and hopefully you will very soon, uh, I will be very glad to take you on a tour of the Levinsky market. I always take tourists to the Levinsky market because I think it's very, very special. It's the secret market of Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv has three markets. It has the Hatikva and it has Hakarmel. These are big produce markets. And it has Levinsky, which is a spice and dried good market. It's the favorite of chefs. And the stuff you can find there, you cannot find anywhere else. So talking about chefs, what makes Israeli food so popular today? There are a few reasons for this sudden popularity. The first one, is this, look at this, this is shakshuka and it's delicious and it's wonderful and it's warm and it's good to be had, but most of all, it's very photogenic. It's very Instagram friendly and Israeli food is very Instagram friendly. And nowadays it's very important because if you think of Eastern European food, Polish food, Russian food, Ukrainian food. Personally, I love it, but it's brown food and brown doesn't shoot well. So it's difficult to promote it. Israeli food looks like a street light. It's red, it's, it's yellow, it's green, it's, it, it bursts in, you know, it's, it's very easy to, to advertise Israeli food. Another reason for the popularity of Israeli food has to do, to do with you, British people. And it's this famous book by Yotam Otolenghi and Sami Tamimi, two gorgeous guys and two great chefs and two friends of mine. And they're wonderful. The thing is that this book isn't Israeli. The Jerusalem cookbook, oops, sorry. Uh, I'll put it on again. I'm sorry, I just took it off by mistake. Let me just find it. It's oh, here. Good. Um, the thing is that this book is not, um, is not about the food of Jerusalem. It's about a British fantasy about what the food of Jerusalem is. I was born in Jerusalem, Yotam and Sami too. Yotam was one year uh, after me in high school. Um, but you don't eat in Jerusalem the food that you would find in the Jerusalem cookbook, which is a wonderful cookbook because they're great chefs, but this is not authentic Jerusalemite food. It's already done. It's very British and it's very good. And it was an amazing promotion to the foods of Israel, although it does not contain a lot of them. Um, another reason uh, for uh, Israeli food to be so popular, and again, it has to do with Britain and London, is uh, this guy. Uh, Asaf Granit, a very famous Israeli chef, as you can see from the picture, nowadays chefs are rock stars. 
You know, gone are the days when chefs were elderly men with glasses, etc. Now they have to look like, you know, fighters. And uh, Asaf Granit started a restaurant in Jerusalem in the Machane Yehuda market. It was called Machne Yehuda. Now it's a group of eight restaurants. It's very successful in Israel. And shortly, shortly thereafter, he opened a, a restaurant in London. And uh, this restaurant was Palomar at the Soho. There it is. And, uh, you know, right after it was opened in London, it was, you know, everybody was talking about it. It was impossible to get a table at Palomar. It's a very small restaurant. As you can see, the chefs are standing behind a bar. You sit at the bar and you look at the chefs cooking your food. And um, it was very, very, very difficult to get a table at Palomar. But um, since I know Asaf and I was in London, I phoned him up and I said, Asaf, I'm in London. I want to eat at Palomar. I said, come, come over. And I said, but would you have a, 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 a seat for me? And he said, oh, I will manage. So I was telling about this to my friend, Joe Nathan. You may have heard the name Joe Nathan. She is uh, writing at the New York Times about Jewish food. And Joan is a lovely, lovely, beautiful lady, as you can see. And uh, she knows everything about Jewish food, but Joan is um, a bit absent-minded. You never know where you are with her. Sometimes she remembers, sometimes she doesn't. And uh, I just mentioned to Joan that I was going to go to Palomar, the coast of the town. But, you know, I didn't invite her to come with me because I wasn't certain that I was going to get a table or at least a chair. Here I am at the Palomar sitting at the bar. So let's see, let's look at the bar again. Sitting at the bar, there wasn't a space for me, but they told me you stand in between two chairs, in between two blue chairs and, you know, you'll, you'll get by and there's no space and I'm blocking the way of the waiters and who comes in? Of course, Joe Nathan. Oops, again, I, I took it out. I'm sorry. Here, I'll find it. Who comes in? Joe Nathan. And she says, hi, I'm here. Um, you, you told me to come. And I, I said, anyway, we're blocking the, the, the whole restaurant now. In Machane Yehuda, in the uh, original restaurant of Asaf Granit, the whole thing is the atmosphere. The waitresses are dancing on the tables and people are singing and it's very noisy, etc., etc., etc. Asaf gave the British waiters this uh, brief. Try to behave like an Israeli. Try to give Israeli service, very informal. And honest to God, I'm sitting there with John Nathan and the waiters are kicking us with their feet. They are kicking us. And I don't get it. I mean, she is, you know, the queen of Jewish cuisine. And I am sort of the queen of Israeli cuisine. Ah, they're kicking us. So it can be a bit tough to be in an Israeli restaurant. Another person, another chef that's responsible for the fame of Israeli cuisine is this guy, very dramatic, Eyal Shani. As you can see, another rock star. He has a love story with tomatoes. Eyal opened uh, a chain of restaurants called Miznon. Miznon is, um, Miznon means a canteen. So he opened a, a, this chain of restaurants all over Europe. I think it hasn't arrived in, uh, in uh, London yet, but it's in Paris and in Vienna and in Australia, etc., and in New York, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very straightforward, robust, simple Israeli food, always served in pita bread, always in pita bread. So talking about pita bread, what is the dish of Israeli food today? So the Israeli cuisine is focusing on street food nowadays. 
And uh, the most um, known dish or popular dish right now is this dish. It's called arais. Arais is the Arab version of a hamburger. You take chopped meat or minced meat with herbs, you put it inside a pita bread, and then you grill the pita bread with the meat on, on charcoal, and then you slice it and you add sauces, and it's, it's delicious. This picture was taken in a restaurant called Hakubiya in the Hatikva market in Tel Aviv. Talking about restaurants in Tel Aviv, people always ask me, so what is the best restaurant in Tel Aviv? Where should I go to? So one of the very good restaurants of Tel Aviv is Hakubiya with the Arais dish. Uh, another very good restaurant is called Topolopompo. That's a very complicated name, Topolopompo. Look at this dish, how beautiful it is. I think it's one of the most beautiful dishes to be served in Israel right now. This is pumpkin, grilled pumpkin in a sauce sitting on black lentils. It's called a Tamil spicy pumpkin. Topolopompo is a restaurant opened by a very, very talented chef called Avi Conforti. Uh, usually people, when they come to Israel, uh, tourists usually say, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I won't go to a pan-Asian restaurant because this I have at home. But I think that, that Topolo Pompo is really a restaurant not to be missed. As you can see, the food is very sophisticated and by the way, very expensive. On the other hand, you have this. This comes from Jerusalem, from a restaurant called Ish Tabach Shemo. Uh, this dish is called Shamburak. And uh, the Shamburak, is a sort of a pun. I think you'll show something not clear. I'll, I'll show it again here. Can you see it? This is the shamburak okay. and you see that it's, it's, uh, it's in a taboon. It's just going to go in a taboon. The sham shamburak, uh, it has the Hebrew uh, meaning of she mevorach. What is she mevorach in Hebrew? She mevorach means blessed because this dish is a pastry filled with the blessed leftovers of the Shabbat dinner. So after the Shabbat dinner, where you're having the best food of the week, you keep the leftovers and with them, you make food for the rest of the week. And this is the only restaurant in the world to be serving the, uh, the Shamburak, and I think it's very special and it's very cheap as well. Another very good restaurant in Israel is a restaurant serving this dish. This is grilled a whole loaf of cheese on tomato sauce uh, and tomato and pepper sauce. It's in a restaurant called Igra Bameshek. Igra is the name of the restaurant. Bameshek is in the farm. So, you know, farm to table is very big in Israel right now, but this is a restaurant in Tel Aviv that did the opposite. They did table to farm. So this is a Tel Aviv restaurant, Igra is a Tel Aviv restaurant, but they said, since farm to table is so strong, let's open a restaurant in the farm that sells us our produce. So it's near the Gaza Strip, it's almost on the border in a moshav called Kfar Hanagid, and it's a lovely, lovely, lovely restaurant. You sit on a beautiful porch overlooking the fields and uh, they serve really, really good food. Uh, let's go to another restaurant in Israel. Let's see what we have here. Yes, this is my favorite. I think that this comes from the restaurant that is the top restaurant of Israel right now. It's a restaurant called Luna. Luna is the name of an Arab, <laughs> Christian Arab lady. It's in Nazareth. Uh, Luna opened a restaurant in a shopping mall, believe it or not, in a shopping mall, on top of a shopping mall near Nazareth. And uh, she told me that when she opened the restaurant, she put an ad in the newspaper that she's looking for women to come and work in the restaurant. 
she got hundreds and hundreds of applications from Arab women that do not have any chance to get out of home and get a job. And she said, it was heartbreaking. I wanted to hire them all, but she couldn't, of course. Uh, so she hired about a dozen and it's an amazing restaurant serving traditional Arab foods with a modern flair. This dish is a very special one. It's called El Ma'ashuka. El Ma'ashuka in Arabic means the beloved lady. It's meatballs in the sauce of uh, rose petals, ginger, and dates. And uh, it's a traditional Syrian dish from the days that Syria was an empire. You know that in the Middle East, food goes from south to north. So Egypt is sort of okay. Israel and Palestine are slightly better. Lebanon is to be admired. Syria is the queen and then Turkey is the empire. So the further up you go, the better food gets. Uh, Luna learned how to make El Ma'ashuka from a Syrian refugee uh, who fled to London, by the way, and uh, through the internet she made contact with this lady and got the recipe of this, um, of El Ma'ashuka, which is a recipe from the 15th century. So this was a quick run of the best restaurants in Israel, and to end our short talk, People usually ask me, okay, so when I go to Israel, what should I buy? What should I bring home? So a few ingredients that should be bought in Israel. First of all, tahini. So this is a choice of uh, the main brands of tahini in Israel. As you can see in the front, we have the pigeon tahini. Usually good tahinis have little animals on the etiquette. You have the pigeon tahini, the donkey tahini, the camel tahini, it's very good. This is another Israeli staple. Uh, this is uh, amba. This is the very, very, very spicy Iraqi yellow or orange sauce. It comes actually. It comes from. Um, it comes from. Let me just put it on again. It keeps running out. Let's see. Can you see it? No, sorry, we'll, I'll do it like this and I'll, sh no, ah, now it, now you'll see it, I'm sorry, here it is. Okay, so Amba comes from India, in India they call it pickle, it's made of um, raw mango, then it traveled to Iraq. In Iraq, they added uh, fenugreek. And this is why, ah, again, I did it. And this is why you smell of it. After you eat it, you will smell of it because fenugreek comes out in the sweat. Another Israeli staple would be um, this. Let's see if you can see it. No, just a second and you'll see it. Now you'll see it here. Another Israeli staple, soup mandel. We call it shkedei marak. We eat everything with shkedei marak and uh, sometimes we just eat them as a snack because they're so good and they're good to buy in Israel. Uh, another thing that you would want to buy in Israel is uh, this. Zatar. This is how they sell zatar in the old city in Jerusalem. They make a mountain of zatar, and on top of it, they put a little statue of the Dome of the Rock. And you see, this is a combination of zatar, sesame seed, and sumac. Uh, olive oil, of course, at least pretend to be using Israeli olive oil. Wine. So people often ask me, what wine should I bring, should I buy in Israel? What wine should I bring over from Israel? Something that would be very uniquely Israel and special. And my favorite is this winery. It's called Yatir. It's the most Southern winery in Israel. It's way in the desert. And they make wonderful, wonderful, robust new world wines. It's really, really, really good. 
Um, another thing that you may want to bring from Israel is orange blossom water. It's a wonderful spice for desserts. And to end with what we started with, sumac, because sumac is very Israeli, it is, belongs in Israel and has a very, very distinct Israeli flavor. Uh, this was my short talk about Israeli food and I'll be very glad to answer any question you have. I, ah, so I see, please can you say again that the farm restaurant near Gaza. So the name of the restaurant is Igra Bameshek. Igra is a mountain in Aramaic and uh, you have, they have their main restaurant, Igra is in Tel Aviv, but the farm restaurant is Igra Bameshek, which means Igra in the farm. It's in a moshav called Kfar Hanagid. Kfar Hanagid is about, I would say 45 minutes south of Tel Aviv and 15 minutes away from the Gaza Strip. So, this is where it is. Uh, the, please, could you write the names of the restaurants and the dishes and the locations? I will send. Uh, I will send the file with all the restaurant names, and they, this will be distributed to you guys. Uh, you have the recording on the Facebook page of WZO UK. You can ah, watch good. it and listen. It's again and again and again. Good. Good. Any more questions? All uh, clear. You, maybe you can, uh, can you hear me? Maybe you can talk a little bit about how you came to, how you became a chef and uh, how did it start? So the truth is that I'm not a chef. Now I can tell you after the lecture, uh, I'm not a chef. I never worked in a restaurant except for being a waiter or a bartender, but I never cooked commercially. Um, and uh, I think that my ticket is home cooking. I always say that my preferred dishes and food would be something in red sauce that's served from a pot with a lid, preferably by a lady over 80. This is the best food. And this is the food I like the best. And this is the food that my maternal grandmother, whom I grew up with, I mean, we all lived in the same big house. So as it was put to us, she wasn't living with us. We were living with her. Uh, she used, we had two maids, but she used to cook. And these are the foods that she made. And the day she passed away, when I was 20, I started cooking just to, to remember her flavor. So this is why I deal with food. I think that food is about love and is about giving and is about hugging. This is why I constantly refuse to be a judge at a master chef or this chef or iron chef. They keep calling me and saying, come and participate in these shows. And I dislike them because I don't think that food is about competitions. I think that food is about really caring for one another, especially in this strange time that we're going through. You know, we all come back to the kitchen. We all cook very simply now because we want to stick to something that we know, to something that we remember. And this is my belief that the best food is something that, you know, you touch it with your tongue and you already know the whole story. So what is your favorite food? My favorite dish would be kubane. Kubane is a Yemenite bread, is a festive Yemenite bread. Um, which is uh, something that we used to eat when I was a kid at my paternal grandmother's house. So we would walk to her home every Shabbat. And this is the Yemenite festive bread that you serve on Shabbat. You know, the Yemenite saying is that when Kubane is on the table, all other breads should kneel down because Kubane is the queen and for me, it's, it's the taste of childhood. And I still make Kubane every Shabbat. It's wonderful. It's simple. It's very basic. You eat it with tomato sauce and schug, which is a very spicy Yemenite salsa. 
and it's the best. And can you talk a little bit about your lineage to the big Eliezer Ben Yehuda? <laughs> no, Eliezer Ben Yehuda was my great grandfather. Of course, I didn't know him. He died. He passed away in 1922, 40 years before I was born. Uh, he's my mother's grandfather, and he was, you know, he was a prophet. He revived Hebrew. It's because of him that I have a culture and I have a language and I have a homeland, and uh, we're very proud of him. Very, very proud of him. We have some more question on the chat. Uh, most of the Israeli food you mentioned seems to have Arabic names. Uh, Israeli food, you know, Israeli food, first of all, is very connected to the Middle East and to the Arab neighborhood in which we, we live. And Israel is becoming more and more and more Arab and more and more and more absorbed in the, the region in which we live. And I find it wonderful and fascinating and uh, it doesn't mean that it's a replica of Arab food. It's an Israeli version of the food that is uh, across the border or in other parts of Israel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't see a point in arguing who invented what, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because this food belongs in the region, and and the, you know Jordanians were not necessarily in Jordan a few generations ago, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, it's Middle Eastern food. Yes, the names are definitely Arab. And this is an amazing tradition that we all look up to. And it's a great culture. And uh, we have a lot to learn from our neighbors and to share with them. And if you look at Arab foods, uh, Israeli Arab foods, some of them are influenced by, by uh, Jewish food from Eastern Europe, from Ethiopia, from uh, the United States, from, from Western Europe, from Northern Europe. So it's a sort of an exchange. And I think that this is what, this is what makes Israeli food so vibrant and so potent and so good. Since, uh, since you haven't touched this uh, subject and it's, it's quite uh, important for me, um, Every time that they make a hummus competition in Israel and they talk about a specific place, they never mention Ashkara in Tel Aviv. <laughs> and I see that as a very serious uh, and, you know, serious offense here. So can you explain why? I don't know why they don't mention Ashkara, but I can tell you that, you know, every Israeli has his hummus joint that he believes in. As a Jerusalem-born Israeli, I live in Tel Aviv and I love Tel Aviv and this is my hometown now, but having been born in Jerusalem, I don't think the Tel Avivians even have the right to speak about hummus because what do they know? Hummus comes from Jerusalem. So we can argue about hummus, you know, for, for not for hours, but for decades. Um, personally, I believe my favorite is, is a hummus joint in Jerusalem that's called Akramawi. It's across the street from the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem. But, you know, in Tel Aviv, you may find Ashkarain, you may find Abu Hassan, of course, and Hakosem, and now. Sorry, no, so no, 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 never heard the name of the other one. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> After Ashkara, you stopped hearing? No, sorry, my hearing is not so good today. No, no, Abu Hassan is okay. Hakosem is. Okay, we, we should not make it a hummus discussion. I apologize. <laughs> Listen, Hakosem just published a cookbook. It's very successful around the world. Hakosem is a fine establishment. Uh, for those of you who don't know Hakosem, it's near the Dizengoff Center shopping mall. And actually it started as a falafel joint. Then it started serving uh, soups. And now it serves hummus as well. And they, they, they published a, a very beautiful hummus and falafel cookbook that sells wonderfully around the world. But again, see, it, it, this is a sort of chord for Israelis. You, you mentioned another hummus joint and immediately we're very touchy about it. About it. So let's, let's keep it friendly here. <laughs> okay, next question, please. Uh, you mentioned the restaurant called Ishtabach. Is this is one in Gush Tzion? Ishtabach is in uh, Jerusalem. It's in the center, no, not in the center, but it's near, it's in the Machane Yehuda market. It's just across the street from the famous Machane Yehuda restaurant. It's on Hashikma Street. 
Hashikma. It's Machne Yuda adjacent. It's like at the, at the very end of the market. Next I one, see, how do you know, how do yes. you know uh, what the Ha'adom Ha'adom Aze was lentil? Uh, no, we know that it's a lentil soup. Uh, uh, I think that it's even mentioned that it's a lentil soup. And if not, it was, it's clear by excavations, etc., etc., that this was the main soup that was being had in the Middle East in those days. By the way, do you know what was what the land of Israel was exporting in biblical times to the world? Fish sauce. In excavations near the Sea of Galilee, they found a huge, huge factory of fish sauce. Uh, these were fermented fish from the Sea of Galilee, and these were sent by ship in uh, clay jars to Rome. And this was what uh, the land of Israel was living off in those times. What is the name of substance? You say they make falafel in Egypt. How is it called in Hebrew? Uh, it's, uh, we call it in the, by the Arab name, ful. Uh, it's uh, dry fava beans. It's, uh, but these are special uh, fava beans because they're dry and they're peeled. So it's very important that they're peeled because you know you don't cook them to make the, the ta'amiya, to make the, the Egyptian falafel. You just soak them overnight and then they become soft because they don't have the skin. So these are dried, peeled fava beans. In Hebrew, we say ful, which is you would the, the, the word would be polim but uh, in Hebrew but nobody uses it we, we say okay. full. Uh, what is the secret of to making great shakshuka? Um, the secret is uh, using a spice that's not very popular in Europe it's called kara karawiya you can hear the resemblance to the sound of caraway seeds because it's caraway seeds, but they're not in their regular form. They're, pow they're powdered. And once you powder caraway seeds, it changes not only the texture, of course, but also the taste. So, you know, there's a very big ongoing discussion about what are the origins of shakshuka. It's something North African, but is it the south of Tunisia or is it Algeria or is it Libya? This is to be discussed, but the spice that they all add to the tomato sauce by the end of cooking is this karawiya that gives it some smoky um, flavor that's very good. You cannot uh, ground caraway seeds at home in a food processor because they need to be powdered. So if you want to get it, either buy it in an Arab spice shop, I'm sure they have it. If not, buy caraway seeds, but gr have them ground in the shop because they have special grinders that are very strong and they can powder the caraway seeds. Is there an Eastern Europe Jewish food that you like? Ah, tons of it. I love Eastern European food, but you know, again, in Israel, it's almost extinct. So we were lucky enough to have a huge wave of immigration from the former Soviet Union to Israel. So more than a million uh, Jews came over to Israel. But food wise, except for the Bukharian uh, community that opened a lot of restaurants in Israel, not a lot of Russian restaurants opened. Russian clubs, Yes, and in Russian clubs, you do serve Russian food, but Russian restaurants, no. This is food that's cooked at home and is not served in Israeli restaurants. So we didn't see a revival, let's say, of gefilte fish and of, of all these kinds of foods. And actually nowadays, if, if you come to Israel and you want to find chicken soup in a restaurant, it's really, really difficult. In Tel Aviv, maybe we have two or three, um, you know, Eastern European restaurants, that's it. And we have hundreds of Middle Eastern restaurants. So Eastern European food is nearly extinct in Israel. It's strange. In restaurants, in homes, it's something else. What is the most popular, what is the most popular foreign food in Tel Aviv? 
I would say sushi. Sushi, you know, it's God's punishment to the Japanese for Pearl Harbor. I detest sushi, but uh, like everywhere else in the world, Israelis love sushi and it's super popular. Um, can you say something about Kube in Haifa? In Haifa, I don't know. What's strange about Kube, you know, that Jerusalem is a Kube city. You can get wonderful Kube soup in Jerusalem. There's a wonderful Kube restaurant called Morduch. Um, again, Machane Uda adjacent. And another restaurant called um, Shamule near the Machane Uda, et cetera, et cetera. In Tel Aviv, no Kube. So only if you go to a Hatikva market, which is in the deep south of Tel Aviv, and it's in a neighborhood that's split between Yemenites and Iraqis, so Kube is an Iraqi or Kurdish soup, either Iraqi or Kurdish or Syrian. So the Iraqis in Hatikva neighborhood and in Hatikva market make a Kube soup. In Haifa, I don't know. I'm sure there is some Kube restaurants, but I, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, more questions, please. Ladies and gentlemen, you're quiet. Are, are any of the restaurants that you have mentioned kosher? Uh, some of them are. Uh, Topolo Pompo, the, the, fame, the, the, the very, very sophisticated uh, uh, Pan-Asian isn't kosher. Igra Bameshek, I'm not sure that is kosher or not. Uh, no, it's not kosher because they have both chicken and cheese, so it's not kosher. But street food in Israel is usually kosher. And uh, so the restaurants that I mentioned in Machane Yehuda are kosher. Let's see what else. Luna is not kosher because it's Arab, of course. And uh, that's about it, I think. that. Uh, but again, simple food in Israel is mainly kosher. Uh, Hakubiya, the restaurant in Atikva Market, where they were, I, I was talking about the Arais, about the Arab hamburger, is kosher. Uh, so there, yeah, there are many. Usually in Jerusalem, it would be difficult to find a non kosher restaurant. In Tel Aviv, it would be difficult to find a kosher restaurant. This is the split in Israel. But down in the south, near Ashkelon, on the Moshevim and on the Marina in Ashkelon, Mm -hmm. There are lots of restaurants, and there's a tiny, tiny hummus restaurant, which is quite amazing. It's tiny. It doesn't even look like a... Anything. Really? You have, to, you have to look out for it as you're walking past it. Do you remember yeah. the name? I don't know the name. It's just this little guy. And he just worked <laughs> with one other person, and the, 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 the hummus is really good. Yeah. I'll look him up. The next time I go down south, I'll look him up. And then there's the Moshavim, sort of between Ganyavna, or between Ashdod and Ashkelon. There yes, so, so actually this, this uh, Igra Bameshek is in this region. Yes, it's, it's, very, it's uh, east of Ashdod, yes. And in the Moshavim over there, yes, you can find wonderful restaurants and very diverse, you know, they, they, you have uh, um, Argentinian restaurants and Brazilian restaurants and the, of course, Tripolitan restaurants and Yemenite restaurants. And it's very, it's, it's fun, it's fun to go there. And because the population of Ashdod and Ashkelon, um, are more traditional, uh, they're, they're, they're orthodox and they're traditional, so there's a lot more kosher restaurants down that region than there are, for instance, in Tel Aviv. Definitely, although Ashdod is becoming very, very Russian, and usually mm -hmm. Russian people are not that religious, so now you have a lot of non-kosher restaurants in Ashdod as well, but in Ashkelon, definitely. Ashkelon is all uh, kosher. Uh, Ashkelon has uh, Mifgash and Itzachon, Ashdod has Idi, which were always there. Yes. I wouldn't say none, none, neither of them is kosher, because, well, it's not. Uh, no, Mifgash and Itzachon is Romanian and non-kosher, and Idi is a seafood restaurant, a fish and seafood restaurant, a lovely restaurant, is, and is non-kosher, of course. Okay, next one, like about shakshuka, what is the uh, secret to make great hummus? Hummus, I would say that at least my secret is that I think that hummus should never ever meet a refrigerator because um, legumes and chickpeas have a lot of starch in them. Once you chill them, they lose 
the texture that is so velvety and is so wonderful about hummus. It doesn't mean that chilled hummus isn't good. It is good because, you know, the proverb is sex is like pizza, even when it's bad, it's good. It applies to hummus as well. But, uh, and we all buy chill, chilled hummus when we go to the supermarket. But if you really want to have good hummus, it should be at room temperature and not having met the refrigerator ever in its life. It should be fresh and in room temperature. Any other questions? Uh, any good Ethiopian restaurants? Uh, many, but they open and close and open and close. So I never, I never remember the names. There was a wonderful Ethiopian restaurant in the south of Tel Aviv called Tenat. Tenat means the smile of a mother in Ethiopian, which is a wonderful name, uh, but it closed down, unfortunately. Um, Ethiopian food is very special, you know, you have to get used to it because the bread, the injera, that you have everything on injera is very, very, very sour. It's made from fermented uh, special Ethiopian wheat, but once you get used to it, it's very good. But the restaurants are very modest, always kosher, and they close down after, let's say, half a year, so. But the teff that they make the injera from, yes, is, uh, depends on whether it's red, white, or brown. Depends on the taste and the quality of it. So it depends True. on the, the acidity of it. it you know. True. And I, I went to a really, I've really bad made, restaurant. Uh, I made biscotti with teff, and it worked out fine. But okay. I didn't ferment it. I didn't ferment it. Once you ferment it, it, it becomes acidic. Mm. Any other questions, please? Okay. We'll, we'll save some Anyone? for the same for the next time. For okay. The next lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I would like to thank to Gil Chobab uh, for this wonderful evening. Thank you very much uh, to have a time for us in this difficult thank times. Uh, thank you very thank much, you. guys. Yes. And uh, uh, keep safe you. and stay at home. And uh, in, in yeah, two or three or four weeks, I'll see you either in London or in Tel Aviv. Yes, I would like to thank you all. Stay safe. Uh, Pesach Sameach. We have Pesach next week. Uh, we're going to have Zoom Pesach, probably all of us. Uh, stay safe, take care. And uh, yes, Shalom, Tel Aviv Shalom. or Jerusalem. Bye thank bye. you very much. Bye bye. Have a great bye bye. evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.